Hi, I'm David Krell. I'm here with fellow Pandemic Baseball Book Club member, Dan Taylor, author of a fascinating new book called Lights, Camera, Fastball, How the Hollywood Stars Changed Baseball. Dan, I am a baseball history buff and a pop culture history buff. So this was right up my alley. Let's start with the main character in this wonderful book, Bob Cobb. He owned the Brown Derby. How did he come to own the Hollywood stars and how did his restaurant experience impact the ballpark experience for the fans? Well, he was a sportsman. He was an avid sportsman and, and uh, loved baseball. He had played uh, amateur ball growing up in Montana and, and loved the game. Uh, and then what, uh, what had occurred was the uh, San Francisco missions had moved to Los Angeles uh, for the 1938 season. Uh, it, was a terrible season for them. They didn't draw very well, sharing the ballpark with the, the LA Angels. Uh, their owner uh, suffered some major hits and in, in, uh, lost some uh, ma major lawsuits and, uh, and was really bankrupt and uh, put the team up for sale. He was liquidating assets. His LA attorney was also Bob Cobb uh, and the Brown Derby's attorney. And uh, so he secured a uh, right of uh, like a first option for Cobb to be able to buy the ball club, the Hollywood Stars. And uh, initially, Cobb uh, didn't pay attention to the note, just stuffed it on a blotter on his desk. And and uh, not long before the deadline that uh, he, his attorney had arranged for him, he found the note, seized upon it and, and called his attorney and said, let's do this. And uh, the Brown Derby was a mecca. The Hollywood and Vine Brown yeah. Derby especially was a real mecca for the movie star crowd. The studios were all up and down the block. And so they would come in there for lunch and occasionally dinner. He developed great friendships. And a lot of the big stars of that era were huge baseball fans. And uh, so with his attorney, Cobb came up with the idea of a share offering, $7,000 a share. Each person could only purchase one share. And uh, it was, in effect, a nonprofit. All, all profits would go back into the, the ballpark or the club. And uh, relatively fast, uh, about 18 hours, uh, he was able to, to raise all the money necessary, buy the ball club, and pay for half of uh, construction on a new ballpark for the team. Now, they played at a site called Gilmore Field. Who was Gilmore? Earl Gilmore was uh, an oil man. His, his father... Uh, had land, uh, sheep and whatnot, and uh, was drilling for water uh, when he struck oil. Right. And uh, when the father passed away, Earl Gilmore took over the family business. The family business is still there today. Um, and uh, Gilmore was a real entrepreneurial guy. Uh, he had the largest chain of gas stations up and down the West Coast. Um, you know, got into property development, uh, built a football stadium, Gilmore Stadium. And uh, so when Cobb and his attorney, Victor Ford Collins, approached him with the idea of uh, utilizing uh, some of his land for a ballpark, you know, well, they reached a pretty quick agreement. And, and Earl Gilmore, uh, you know, ever the, the showman and ever the uh, publicity guy, uh, insisted on it bearing his name. And, uh, and that's how the ballpark came to be. In Chicago, when Sabre had its convention there a few years ago, I had the opportunity to give a lecture on Bleacher Bums, the play that was written by Joe Montagna and his fellow young actors, young struggling actors at the Organic Theater Company in Chicago. And that's about the Chicago Cubs and how people in the stands would bet on everything, the attendance, whether a guy would get to first base, if he would get to first base, would it be by a walk or a hit or a hit by pitch? But you talk about gambling at Gilmore Field quite a bit in the early 50s and the 40s. Take us through that. How prevalent was it at Gilmore? Very prevalent. I mean, I, I talked to people who were, um, you know, kids and, and teenagers during that era, and they were enthralled by it. They hadn't seen paper money as young kids and uh and you had actors george raft was very much involved with it well, sure and and they would have uh initially they, they just did it wherever they sat and his parents complained and and the police tried to crack down on it they took 
you know, more elaborate measures to conceal what they were doing. And generally they were down the left field line uh, near the end of the grandstands next to the bleachers, uh, tried to, trying to get away from as many fans as possible. And they had their circle. And, and just as you described uh, in Chicago, and they were betting on everything. And right. uh, it, it was uh, uh, quite a fascinating situation because it, it involved a lot of different things. There certainly turned out to be some game fixing involved, uh, horse race fixing involved. And it was part of a really large uh, gambling entity in, in Los Angeles at that time. Now, you talk quite, uh, I don't know what the word would be, quite extensively about some players where I actually did a double take because I didn't know about their minor league careers. And this is towards the end of their careers. And I'm talking specifically about Charlie Root and Babe Herman. Now, even though they were past their prime in the majors, they still had contributions to make in the minors. And you know, Charlie Root is famous for the Babe Ruth called shot, whether he did call it or not in the 32 World Series. And Babe Herman was a hero to Brooklyn. What were their impacts? What did you learn about those players in your research? Well, I think the Babe Herman sign was huge for Hollywood. He was the second player they signed. Uh, when Bob Cobb uh, uh, secured the deal to buy the ball club, he, he immediately contacted his manager who had just arrived at the winter meetings. And uh, he had left Los Angeles feeling he had no, me- no money to spend. And suddenly he gets a, you know, a cable from Cobb telling him that, uh, he's got $50,000 to spend to improve the ball club. And uh, Bill Sissel, the former White Sox second baseman who the Giants had picked up late in the 38 season was available. They bought him. And then uh, the Giants had Babe Herman at Jersey City in 38. Right. And, and they pounced on the opportunity to get him. Uh, he was a big name in Southern California, a multi-sports star in high school, uh, you know, very uh, often in, involved in, in winter ball games in, in Los Angeles, uh, he was a, he was a big name. And, and so getting Babe Herman brought them instant credibility. I mean, I, I think that was, you know, the whole star power idea that was in the movie industry that, that Cobb embraced, uh, with a minor league team, which was so unique. And, and, and Herman had some good years. There were some things that puzzled me a little bit, Bill Sweeney becoming the manager. He was a first baseman and he bumped, uh, he bumped Herman off a of first base and Herman just didn't have the legs anymore to play in the outfield. Uh, I thought that was really a strange move, but uh, you know, Herman had some big years. He, he won a coast league batting title. Um, you know, things became a little contentious late where he was, I think frustrated that he'd been passed over to be the manager. And when they started the California league, he wanted to manage their club in the California league and was passed over. And, and I think he was a little uh, uh, upset about that. And then ultimately he sat out that 45 season and, and Brian right. Ricky came along and bought him, but that was a big, that was a big move. And I think they looked similarly at root uh, being able to grab him uh, because he, he, you know, it was a big name. Uh, they knew he would be box office. He had the one very good year uh, managing for them. Didn't work out. They stayed on good terms though. And when they created the Billings Mustangs, a, a farm team in the pioneer league, uh, they, they named root to be the manager of their ball club which they owned and operated. And uh, so the, but, but Root was, he was, he was similar to, uh, to Babe Herman. That was, that was a real big sign for Hollywood to get Charlie Root. I'm David Krell. We're talking with fellow Pandemic Baseball Book Club member, Dan Taylor, author of Lights, Camera, Fastball, How the Hollywood Stars Changed Baseball. Speaking of bat- batting titles, Dan, you chronicle the 1943 rivalry between Johnny Dickshot, real name, and Andy Pafko. And this underscores a rivalry, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The Los Angeles Angels and the Hollywood Stars had a rivalry as fierce as Michigan and Ohio State, as USC and UCLA. Uh, take us through the batting title, and we'll talk about the, the rivalry at large, but I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in, in your research on how this came to be and what surprised you, if anything, about Pafco and Dickshot. Oh, well, I, I got hooked on it the minute I saw what Dickshot's uh, nickname was. Ugly. <laughs> <laughs> great nicknames back in the day, but no, it, it went down to the wire, it went down to the last game of the season, the two of them battling it out. Uh, Dick shot had a tremendous year and that, uh, that year vaulted him back into the big leagues. Um, but it, it, it just kind of was part and parcel of that fierce rivalry between the, uh, the stars 
and the crosstown rival angels and uh, the stars weren't having a very good season at all. So for right. them having Dick shot in the, in the chase for the batting title really, uh, you know, was, was a draw and it, it, it was a source of publicity and, and uh, you know, it was a big thing for their fans as well. Now we're talking about Southern California during world war II, and there's a great danger or at least a perceived danger of the Japanese attacking the West Coast. That was a primary concern. And you talk about the impact of those concerns on the Pacific Coast League. What were those concerns and how did they impact the fans and the, and the ballparks and the teams? Well, initially, uh, the first thing that happened was they were concerned about having enough law enforcement uh, to handle the necessary policing work because their, their jobs were going to expand uh, in, into a lot of things that were tied into blackout policies and things of that nature. Uh, so they wanted to put caps on the, the crowds. That was something they initially pondered. I think they backed away from that um, after a few months of, of consideration. But the, the, they had uh, blackout rules then and, and there was a distance in from the coast uh, in which uh, there had to be a, a, a nighttime blackout rule. And so that meant that the Coast League teams had to play day games. Right. Um, uh, Hollywood, they felt they were far enough inland where it wouldn't bother them, but they were worried about illuminating uh, the, the, the shadows of, of ships and giving submarines targets. So uh, Hollywood and, and the Angels, uh, San Francisco and Oakland, uh, they all had to go to day baseball. Uh, San Diego as well. And, and that was difficult. I mean, they, they initially they uh, looked at, at different times to try to push it back as late as possible. Um, and it, it certainly affected attendance uh, significantly. Um, the last night game they were able to have, the, the stars tried a promotion as flashy and gimmickry as they were. They tried to uh, make their, their uniforms uh, like a neon, uh, and, and I can't think of the name of the, off the top of my head, the, the substance they painted the uniforms with, and they were going to shut off the lights, and then the players were going to be illuminated, and, and it didn't work. <laughs> it was a colossal flop. Right. But, but it was a real tough time. I mean, Sacramento didn't draw very well at all, and, and their, their club was in real serious peril. Uh, there was a lot of concern about whether the Coast League would, would survive the war uh, economically, but uh, uh, Hollywood did a lot, uh, got very involved in the war effort, um, you know, did things where you bring scrap metal or scrap rubber to the park and you could get a discounted or free admission and uh, they, they were able to get through, but, but it was a real tough time. Now, the Pacific Coast League is a rich story in and of itself. I have a few books behind me that cover the league in total. I've never seen a book about the Hollywood stars. And this book seems like it's long overdue because as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, I can't believe nobody chronicled this story yet. And you come along, how did you do the research? Because to my knowledge, there's no audio of the games. There's no television broadcasts of the games that survive which I guess is not just in the minors, but the majors too. It's very difficult to find uh, a Dodgers Giants series uh, from 1954, which would give us you know, great insight. How did you go about the research for this? Oh, gosh. Uh, the impetus for this was my relationship with George Genovese, the legendary scout. I wrote a book about him in 2017, um, a scout's report, my 70 years in in baseball and uh, George played for Hollywood in 49 and 51 uh, had a little stint with the Washington Senators in between mm -hmm. and uh, we spent a lot of time together we became great friends and and uh, went to a lot of games and and invariably something would happen at the park or on the field when and George would draw the connection to Hollywood and it struck me that that Hollywood and whoever was behind this never really got the credit due right. uh, for these innovations and that's what kind of got me uh, looking into it a lot. And George and I talked uh, before he passed, we talked a lot about the stars and, and, and I kind of followed that and reached out to a lot of former players and people involved and, um, 
and then just you know pouring through things in libraries and digitized newspapers. Uh, it, it was a fascinating project. I love doing research, and and uh, it was really like time travel. Some mornings where you'd yeah. wake up and get into an online newspaper, and it, and it felt like you're reading the morning paper, and and it's actually 1942 or something. But uh, uh, it, just talking with the with the the former players, it was it was really fascinating that that here these guys, many of them had great experiences in the big league, but big leagues, but maybe their most cherished time in the game was with Hollywood, mm-hmm. and and uh, talking to to family members that's what really struck me because uh, many of them uh, their father or grandfather or uncle had gone on and played in the big leagues right. but uh, the, what they cherished the most was their time with hollywood and, and it was really interesting to, the stories they shared and the, you know the publications and and uh, things of that nature that that really helped me through this one of the many things that i learned in the book was the rich source of talent in Southern California at that time. And one of the players you write about is Clint Hufford, who later gets drafted into military service. Um, How did the draft affect the PCL and the stars in particular? Well, when, when, uh, and this is an area that uh, I'll admit I made a mistake in, I didn't go back far enough. And, and I thought Hollywood was the pioneer in this. And really, it was Oscar Reichow, who at that time became the business manager for Hollywood. But mm-hmm. earlier, when he ran the Angels in the, in the early 30s, LA high schools had a lot of financial problems. And year in, year out, there was great debate over whether they should drop baseball entirely in the LA high school system. And so Reichow took advantage of that, as did others in the Coast League to come in and, and sign these underage kids. But, but Cobb and Reichow together realized that there was just a rich trove of talent throughout Southern California. And they felt it important to, from a business model standpoint, to mine that talent. Right. And, uh, you know, they felt like it was really a waste of their time buying broken down end of the career big league guys. You weren't going to be able to resell them. And if you got these young kids, one of two things, good things could happen. You could sell them for a profit uh, or you could hang on to them and they could really help you develop your your organization. And so they jumped on this. You mentioned Clint Hufford being one. They signed while he was still in high school. Uh, Eddie Harrison was a a big, big athlete in in Los Angeles that they signed while he still had high school eligibility. Um, Hufford was, was, he had a tremendous fastball, tremendous pitcher, ended up getting hurt, sadly. Uh, But then they had this this big core of young players and uh, you know bill gray and and todd davis and and hufford and and others and eddie harrison and then the war comes along and one by one uh, they all get drafted and go right. off into military service and and uh, they came out of the military with with different ideas uh, eddie harrison just wanted to get on with life uh begin a career start making money hufford came back they farmed him out he ended up getting hurt so it was just a, you know, a number of different issues. Uh, Eddie Erat, uh, just a tremendous pitching prospect. Uh, they were in dire needs of a third baseman during yeah. the war while he was away, and and they they traded his rights to Cincinnati, and and the deal was they uh, Hollywood would get him for one season before they would turn him over to the Reds, and and in that one season when he comes back from the war, he becomes Hollywood's first ever twenty game winner. Right. Uh, got hurt very quickly after joining the Reds, but uh, yeah, they had a good young crew of a core of talent. And then the other thing that happened is coming out of the war, baseball cracked down on that loophole about signing under underage players and, and Hollywood was no longer able to pursue that practice. Another thing that I found fascinating was the Chronicle after the war. So you have the GIs coming back and housing is a problem across the country. Where are we going to put everybody? And there are apartments that are built across the country, garden apartments, special housing for GIs. GIs get a break maybe on a loan, on a mortgage. Um, But there are some folks connected to the Hollywood Stars Baseball Club that actually used the ballpark as temporary housing. How did that happen? What did they do? Because this is just fascinating to me. Well, and you mentioned that around the country, this was a problem, but it was a huge problem in Southern California because you had war plants and you had you had bases around the area. Mm-hmm. And so you had people from other parts of the, of the country that got exposed 
to living in Southern California and yeah. they decided to plant roots there. So this was a big problem. Hollywood had a player to quit because they couldn't find proper housing for their family. You had the manager wanted to set up a, a, a camper uh, in, in the parking lot and Earl Gilmore shoot him off the property. And you had three or four players that ended up uh, just living on cots in right. the clubhouse because they couldn't find any place to live. It was a, it was a challenge for the stars. And you have a major league figure, Jimmy Dykes, who becomes the manager. What, how, how's that possible? What, what is his trajectory to becoming the Hollywood stars manager? You know, they, they always, one of the things I noticed with Cobb is there was this, uh, he, he had in mind what he wanted in terms of a manager. He wanted that personality. He wanted that guy that, that the media would love, that, that could tell the stories and get quotes in the columns. And so he wanted that big personality and that name. And so when Dykes was fired by the White Sox, you know, the, there was a lot of rumors that, that he was immediately going to be the guy. Right. And, and uh, you know, the, Holly, the, the star's upper management and ownership kind of uh, downplayed that. But ultimately, they, they did make the move and, and brought him in. And, you know, Dykes himself wasn't sure initially that he wanted to do it. He, he wanted to return to the big leagues. But when he realized he didn't have any opportunity, uh, he lived in the area in the off season. So it was a convenience for him. And, and he ended up taking that job. Now it really didn't work out well. And I know initially he felt that the players were a bit soft, uh, but then ultimately ownership felt that he was too soft on the players. And, right. uh, and they had a parting of the ways in, in 1948. And George Genovese told me the story. That was the day that he was acquired from Denver and he was uh, unpacking his gear in the clubhouse and Dykes comes walking through the clubhouse and sees him and said, kid, if you'd have gotten here a little sooner, maybe you'd have saved my job. You talked about Clint Hufford in the book and uh, you addressed his injury a few minutes ago, but in terms of his military service, there's a tale about him being a, a baseball commodity <laughs> for lack of a better word for a general. What happened? At the end of the war, uh, uh, he was part of the occupying force in Japan, and uh, you had, uh, uh, you know, two different uh, generals there in the in the Pacific Theater had a uh, their teams, their their particular uh, army teams, and uh, uh, I'm trying to I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> blanking out on names now, but but. Uh, you know, Hufford was drafted in effect to, to pitch for, for one of the particular teams. And, and he was right. promised if, if you win this ball game, you immediately go home. And, and he did, he pitched the team to a victory and uh, he was ordered in a Jeep right off the off the diamond and uh, uh, driven directly to, to an airfield. And there were officers in line waiting to get on this, this plane home to, to Southern California. And they were brushed aside and here this private or corporal, whatever he was, is, is marched past them to their protests and, and uh, made first on the plane because he had pitched his, his team to a win in this big game and, and uh, given the opportunity to go directly home. <laughs> it was just, it was remarkable. I'm David Krell. I'm talking with fellow Pandemic Baseball Book Club member, Dan Taylor, author of Lights, Camera, Fastball, How the Hollywood Stars Changed Baseball, available now on Amazon. And uh, Hollywood Stars has a double meaning because some people, I understand, tourists would come to the ballpark expecting to see the actual movie stars playing baseball. They might see them in the stands because you talk about a Jimmy Stewart, a George Raft, but there's one figure above all that we must mention, Babe Ruth, who was a celebrity, not just in baseball, but throughout, throughout society, throughout marketing, throughout business. Why was he at Gilmore? Why was he in L.A. in the, in the late 40s? Well, this was in 1948. It was about five months before he died. And he, uh, he and his wife, uh, daughter and son-in-law had uh, taken the train from New York and uh, this was in May, if I remember correctly, and they, they arrived in Los Angeles and the, the very next evening he came out to Gilmore Field to, to catch a game. Now, he was very close with the actor Joe E. Brown, who was a, a big Hollywood Stars fan, a huge sports fan. Uh, but uh, the babe came out to the, to the ballpark. He was in Los Angeles to consult as they were beginning uh, filming on the movie about his life, uh, the Babe Ruth story. 
And uh, uh, so he had a night free, came out to the ballpark and met with a lot of the players. And, and there were two guys uh, that I was introduced to that uh, I spoke to for the book who, who were kids and met him that night and got oh, wow. autographed baseballs that they still is their prized possession now in their 80s. Uh, so quite a very memorable occasion. And of course, one of them mentioned to me that the thing that struck him was how unhealthy Babe looked. Yeah, uh, it was a, it was a May night. He was wearing a heavy overcoat, uh, had his flat flat cap on and, and his skin just looked gray. Yeah. And they didn't understand, uh, you know, what the what the problem was. But certainly we we now know what it was. Another major figure in the book is Fred Haney. But I did not know that Fred Haney was also a broadcaster. That was very compelling to me. What did he bring to the team as far as managing? What was the value that he brought? Well, you know, he was a good baseball man. He was a he was an icon in in Southern California for his high school sports play, and then he went on to play in the Tiger with Tiger organization and in the big leagues with Detroit. Uh, but he was that personality, and there was a lot of debate about whether to sign him as the manager. Uh, and he knew what their problems were, and he wanted a multi year deal, and he wanted control of the roster. Mm -hmm. uh, and he he brought a he brought connections, and he brought a real good uh, evaluation. Uh, ability uh, to know what kind of players he wanted and, and what kind of players would make up a, a successful ball club. Uh, but he was a huge personality uh, from his, his time uh, doing the games on radio. Right. Uh, he, had, he had developed a great following. He created a knot hole gang that had several thousand young people in it. Uh, and, and he was, you know, a very personable guy and he was a very innovative guy. So he was a great fit. And, and he said later when he got fired by Pittsburgh that he, in hindsight, never should have left Hollywood. Uh, I doubt he was saying that in 57 when he won the right. World Series with the Milwaukee Braves, but but uh, he had a good thing going there. He, he really did. He was very popular and uh, he created, he, he turned that franchise around. I mean, they they had never finished in the, in the first division in their first yeah. 10 seasons. And then uh, when he gets in there, he wins the pennant right away in 49 and, and had a really good run. Dan, my Little League years were in the late 70s and I always thought, by watching This Week in Baseball and reading Sports Illustrated that Bill Veck in the late 70s pioneered the use of shorts with his beloved Chicago White Sox ball club. That was not the case. Another fascinating story, um, I read it with my eyes wide open, Bob Cobb really pioneered shorts on the ball field, didn't he? He did. And, and, and uh, Bill Veck, to his credit, did call the White Sox shorts Hollywood shorts in homage to uh, the Hollywood stars. Uh, but uh, Cobb, together with Haney, uh, came up with the idea. A columnist in the Los Angeles Times had uh, the previous season kind of prodded the stars to do something unique uh, with their uniforms. And, uh, and Haney and Cobb put their heads together and came up with the idea of going with shorts. And it wasn't just the short pants, but also they went with a, a T-shirt for the top mm -hmm. rather than the flannel. And, and uh, you know, I talked to, the, to some of the players uh, who were in that clubhouse that day and talked to Sandy Oster, who was the bat boy that day. And, and Sandy said, yeah, you had about half the team that was OK with it. And you had about half the team that was really angry. And I said, well, who were the guys that were angry, thinking he might give me some names? And he said, the guys with the real ugly legs. But uh, the first player to, to come to bat wearing the shorts was Chuck Stevens, their first baseman. He hit leadoff and uh, he legged out an infield hit and Haney coached first base. And as uh, Stevens crossed the bag and the umpire uh, gave the safe sign, Haney turned to the crowd, raised his arms and hollered, see, they work. Excellent. Excellent. Um Hollywood in the 40s and 50s, and we can even date back to the 20s and 30s. My feeling in reading and researching Hollywood history is that it really had a small town feel. And that Definitely. Maybe because, uh, that, that's maybe because the industry was so prominent and LA hadn't expanded into other major areas like defense and commerce and so forth. Um, now, the Hollywood stars benefited from that community feeling. And I guess the angels did as well, but it seems like the stars had something special. And one of the things that jumped out to me 
regarding your book was the, the civic obligation, the civic love between the community and the ball club and vice versa, but they also used that for promotional purposes. What kinds of things did they do in terms of a civic affairs angle? In promoting the ball. Well, they, they, they certainly had community nights and they had a lot of their players who were from the surrounding communities. They had three or four who were from the Long Beach area, 20 miles to the south. And so they would have a Long Beach night and the Chamber of Commerce and civic leaders would come in and, and uh, bring gifts for those players from Long Beach and salute them. And, and they would have a ticket sales drive in that community. And they did this in a, in a lot of the communities, Pasadena and, and, right. and whatnot. And so they, they really got very actively involved in the communities. Now you have to remember when you when you picture Los Angeles today, that was not the way Los Angeles was right. then. It was a lot of different isolated towns and communities. It wasn't this massive, you know, metroplex that we've got today. So uh, yeah, it was. You're right. And and the the, the motion picture industry, uh, well, the whole entertainment industry. I don't know if cottage industry is the right. Uh, terminology for it, but uh, uh, you know, they, it, its tentacles were very deep in that area, sure. um, and, and so particularly with Cobb and and the involvement of the investors and the team from yeah. that industry, it, it pulled uh, and made them very attractive to people in that industry. You mentioned Oscar Reichow. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about him and his contributions to the stars? Interesting guy. He had been a sports writer in Chicago. Uh, he was the guy who first championed uh, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis uh, for the commissioner role. And when he was hired, he got a lot of credit for that in the sporting news and other publications. Uh, he became very close covering the Cubs to uh, Wrigley. And uh, when he was uh, in Southern California covering spring training out on Catalina Island, Wrigley uh, threw the idea at him to, to, to run his minor league club, the Los Angeles Angels, which right. Reichow did. Uh, ultimately, there was a falling out, and uh, and Hollywood pounced on the idea to, to hire him, and uh, that kind of was the first blow in the in the rivalry between the two clubs, uh, right. because Hollywood the previous year had office space in the tower at Wrigley Field there in Los Angeles, and as soon as Reichow was hired, boy, they were kicked out. Uh, but Reichow was an innovative guy. There, 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 there's pluses and minuses to him. Uh, you know, he was a very creative guy, had the idea to create the California League, uh, along with Cobb, very instrumental in pursuing the young amateur talent. But uh, he got a lot of, a lot of uh, criticism for meddling and, and causing a lot of grief for managers. Uh, there, were, uh, there were managers that, that really felt like he was uh, the guy that on. caused their demise. Two hands on? Two hands on, yes. Yeah. Uh, but no, he, he did a tremendous job, uh, with that club. And, and I think is a real unheralded guy in terms of baseball history and, and the things that he's brought to the game. You talk in the book at length about the PCL and its strength. And in the late forties, it almost becomes, um, an independent league. Uh, there was also talk of it being a major league, but I suspect that's more for PCL fans who to this day still consider it. Uh, a, a third major league, although it was never formally inducted. We know that. Um, why do you think it never happened either way? Why do you think it, it never really gained that level? And why didn't it just declare itself an independent league and divorce itself from being a farm system for the majors? Well, it came close. Uh, coming out of World War II in 46, they made their first uh, attempt to gain major league status. Uh, they made three, maybe four attempts at that. And when Ford Frick became the commissioner, he established criteria for the different classifications. And Frick announced that if the major leagues were to expand, it wouldn't be by one or two teams, it would be by an entire league. And, and he determined what the attendance and the population criteria had to be for a league. And then uh, the one that was the real stumbling block for the, for the Pacific Coast League was their ballpark qualities. Right. Uh, Wrigley Field in Los Angeles was pretty much uh, very close, close to being an exact replica of Wrigley Field in Chicago. Seal Stadium in San Francisco didn't meet the requirements, but was close, but Wrigley did. 
but none of the others. Hollywood's Park did not. San Diego, Sacramento, Oakland, uh, Portland, Seattle, uh, their parks did not meet Major League Standard. Right. Um, so uh, there were there were all these uh, discussions about what to do, and and internally there was a big battle among all the league owners about just becoming an outlaw league. And uh, the problem was the, the player contracts. And, and one of the sticking points was that whole minor league draft rule. If you've got a guy for five years, he automatically becomes eligible for the minor league draft and, and you lose him for a fixed price. And Oakland, for instance, had paid something like 20,000 to buy George Metkovich and lost him in, the, in the, that minor league draft for a fraction of that. And so what they ended up doing, and it was Hollywood's attorney who hit on the idea, was to come up with two separate contracts, a white one or a yellow one. And right. if the player did not want to be subjected to the draft, he signed one. And if he, if he wanted to be subjected to the draft and ultimately go to the big leagues, he signed the other. Um, so there was a lot of debate within the league whether to go outlaw. And ultimately they decided, and it was kind of a, a, a compromise with the commissioner's office, um, to become, uh, uh, I don't know, not an independent league, but they were, they were, they were, they were given a classif- classification above okay. AAA. And, and that was kind of the compromise. So they were between AAA and the major leagues. So this is now getting towards the beginning of the end. In 52, Gilmore Stadium gets demolished. Why and what's on that site today? Well, the, the big problem was Earl Gilmore's oil wells were drying up. And so he was shifting his business to more property development, property management. And CBS approached him with the advent of television growing. Uh, they needed more space. And uh, they had this concept of this massive television city project. And they went to him and, and uh, you know, took options on land and the, the immediate area they first wanted to build in was the acreage where the football stadium, Gilmore stadium was located. Right. And really when, when the Rams moved out and decided to, to make the Coliseum their home, as opposed to Gilmore stadium, uh, Earl Gilmore really soured on, on the stadium. And so that was demolished to make way for the first phase of television city and CBS took out an option on additional land. One of which was the 12 acres that, that Gilmore field was on. So uh, Cobb was, at that point, Cobb was looking at it. He had a couple of needs. One, he needed, if they were going to gain major league status, he needed to improve his ballpark. Right. And, and the other, he needed to find another place to play uh, because his lease was going to run out after the 57 season. And CBS clearly was going to take up that land. And that's what kind of drove him in the direction of, of Chavez Ravine. And, and uh, you know, he, he was the first to really hit on that that piece of property is a, a future home for a ballpark. Yeah, I want to talk about that in a little bit. But first, I, I, I'd like to address the Cobb Gilmore uh, rift. Uh, Cobb was forward thinking. Uh, he was forward thinking in his restaurant service. He was forward thinking in the ballpark experience. He was also forward thinking in television. But Gilmore, as you point out in the book, wasn't too keen on television because the, the status quo at that time for movie studios, for sports arenas, was if you put this on television, people won't pay to come and see it live. So how, how was that resolved, if at all? That, that went in through the 70s, David. I mean, uh, how many years before even major league owners finally realized that it was, it was great advertising and, and we have what we have today where every game is on television. But back then it was so new. Yeah. Uh, Cobb was the one who was, he was the lone voice yeah. back in the 50s saying, no, wait a minute. You know, in LA is growing. We have all these new people and families here that have never been exposed to the Hollywood stars. Television is going to do that for us. It's going to create new fans. And, and he was the guy that had the different voice. Everybody else was looking at immediate dollars and cents. Right. Uh, visiting teams got a piece of the gate. They felt television was keeping fans away and they're, you know, their cut was, was less than what they hoped for. And similarly, Earl Gilmore, the lease, uh, the lease deal he had made when he built the ballpark was that he got a percentage of the ticket sales. 
And so when Hollywood started trying to do games, they initiated it in 41 uh, and then picked it up after the war. Uh, and, and Earl Gilmore was very against it because he saw it cutting into uh, his lease revenues uh, on the ballpark. And, and so he went to the point of threatening to cut the cables and taking them to court. And ultimately, they, they gave him a, a big chunk of, uh, of the rights fees that they were getting from the local, local stations there. I mean, it, it, the, the West Coast was not cabled yet with New York. So the network programming being developed in New York wasn't getting out to the West Coast. So the local the stations here on the West Coast were searching for programming. And throughout uh, those six months, baseball was a great opportunity for sure. a station in Los Angeles because you always had either the Angels or the Stars at home. And except for Monday night, which was the universal off day in the Pacific Coast League, you had a game six days out of seven. So it was great for television. My name is David Krell. I'm talking with Dan Taylor, author of Lights, Camera, Fastball, How the Hollywood Stars Changed Baseball, available now on Amazon. Dan, this is a speculative question that we Sabre folks and PBBC folks like to talk about at length and we never truly resolve because they're just ongoing conversations, the, these, uh, these conversations that are triggered by provocative questions like the one I'm about to pose to you. Great. How would things have changed in baseball overall if Bob Cobb had gotten to Chavez Ravine first and secured the rights before Walter O'Malley? Well, I, I certainly think that the Hollywood Stars may be a major league team today and the Pacific Coast League it's hard to say how many, if his model could have worked in other cities, he had a financing model in mind. Um, and it would be interesting to see how it would have worked elsewhere and, and help some of those other markets jump into the big leagues quicker. But if he had gotten into the, into Chavez Ravine and if his financing model had, had worked now, now he was looking to build that park in Chavez Ravine in, in a two stage type of park, yeah. one to, accommodate a Pacific Coast League team, but to be built with an expansion ability um, for the time that, that either uh, the Coast League would get in the major leagues or a major league team would move to Southern California. But I, I, I think that if he had gotten it, um, either Hollywood would have gotten there, uh, he would have maybe been able to put investors together to buy a club and stay in the game or uh, somebody would have come and forced him out and just taken over that park. Hollywood folks love stories about Hollywood. I'm very keen on this becoming a Netflix miniseries at some point. Uh, there's no doubt that if and when that happens an undercurrent will be the Angels stars rivalry that was not only fierce, it was vicious on at least one occasion where there was an all out brawl and the police chief was watching on television and, and took action after that. Um, talk about that day, that, that <laughs> theme in specific, and why you think the Angels stars rivalry has been overlooked or overshadowed perhaps by the Dodgers and the Giants and um, and, and other rivalries. In, in well, I think those that appreciate Pacific Coast League history uh, certainly understand the magnitude of that rivalry. I mean, I talked to guys who were with both organizations and Angels and Stars and, uh, and Dodgers and Giants, and, and they said that the Angels and Stars was the far more venomous, ferocious rivalry uh, yeah. to the Giants and Dodgers. Uh, and it just seemed like from the get-go, uh, there were there were incidents, uh, incidents in the stands. The fans didn't like one another. It really, uh, I mean, I know guys now in their 70s and 80s that were kids back then, and and they still are, are staunch uh, supporters of, of that particular team. And, and uh, you know, guys that I talked to for the book that uh, were staunch Angel fans that were really reluctant to help me because it had to do with Hollywood, and these guys are in their right. 80s. Uh, so it's really remarkable. But, yeah, that, uh, that big. Uh, Sunday doubleheader. Uh, Frankie Kelleher was the hitter. He was the, the favorite player at Hollywood, maybe the, one of their all-time favorites. The only player to have a number re retired by the Stars. And uh, the pitcher threw up and in on him several times and finally drilled him in the back. And 
you know, Frankie, uh, as some of the guys on the club explained, uh, Chuck Stevens was telling me the story, how Frankie just very calmly, he was, a, he was called mousy because he was a real quiet guy. Right. And he just calmly dropped his bat and calmly walked to the mound. And as he got to the pitcher, he hauled off and punched him in the chest and sent the pitcher flying backwards. And you had a Donnie Brook on your hands and, and it raged for, uh, you know, uh, well, th- th- that was the first of the fights. They got that calmed down through Kelleher out of the game right. and uh, brought in the pinch runner, Teddy Beard, uh, who ultimately uh, stole second. And when he slid into third, he, he went in spikes high and, and cut up the, the third baseman. And, and that's when the real Donnie Brook broke out and it raged on for over a half an hour. And as you alluded to, the police chief saw it on television and sent the riot squad out to the ballpark to break it up. And uh, Chuck Stevens told the story that he, he got into the clubhouse first after the first game of the doubleheader. And there's a guy in front of his locker, a guy in a suit. And Chuck hollered at the clubby to, to get him out of there. And the guy turned around, flashed his badge and announced himself as being the sergeant with the riot squad and told the whole team to sit down and, and lay down the law for the second game. Oh my gosh. But, but by Monday morning, by noon Monday, the, their return meeting in a couple of weeks time in, in Wrigley was pretty much sold out. So <laughs> it was uh, it was a remarkable rivalry. And of course, the final time they ever met, the final brawl they ever had was instigated by one Tommy Lasorda, who was pitching that afternoon for the Angels. No doubt that will be a scene in a movie or miniseries. <laughs> There's a tragic story to this chronicle. Um, tell us about Herb Gorman. Herb Gorman was a real popular guy with, with the Stars uh, in the 1949 season on their championship team. And then uh, the Cardinals purchased him in the minor league draft and ultimately assigned him to San Diego. And uh, uh it was Easter Sunday and I want to say 1952 season and they're playing Hollywood. And a lot of the guys were still close friends with him. And uh, Mark Scott, the, the, the founder and the voice on home run derby right. uh, was the Hollywood radio broadcaster. I love my conversations with his daughter, Mary Jane. We touch base from time to time. And, uh, and Mark was very close to Herb Gorman. And uh, during the ball game uh, out in left field, her tragically suffered a heart attack and uh, he was he was rushed to the hospital and and died uh, that day, and it was a, it was a real blow. The, the next day was to be Hollywood's home opener, and 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 Cobb ordered all the fanfare to be uh, muted, and uh, they just played the game with without the usual opening day celebration and right. festivities. It was it was a real somber time uh, for the stars. And, and Gorman had, and his his bride, his new wife, they'd, he'd been married in the off season and they continued to live in the apartment uh, just a couple of blocks away from the ballpark. So Dan, what's the legacy of the Hollywood stars? Because at, when the Dodgers and the Giants come to the West Coast after the 57 season, the LA Angels and the stars in the PCL they have to move They're, They have to get out of LA because the territory now belongs to the major leagues. What is the legacy of the stars team? Well, I believe, and it was one of the, the missions in producing this book that, that, you know, their legacy has always been the celebrity team, the, the phenomenon, right. uh, the team of the movie stars. And, and I really believe it's as the most innovative operation in baseball history. Uh, most of us, uh, I did, certainly didn't appreciate until I dove into this, all the innovations they brought to the game. And I, I, I just can't think of another club. I mean, there've been teams like Chattanooga that, and El Paso in, in the seventies that were very innovative in their promotions. But in terms of bringing new things to the game, you know, grooming the infield, mid innings, uh, short pants, flying television. Uh, I can't think of a club in base at any level of baseball that has brought more new ideas to the game than the Hollywood stars. I think they are the most innovative team that baseball has ever known. Well, I thank you so much for writing this book as a show business buff and as a baseball buff. I, I couldn't be happier. There, there's uh, tinsel and glitter in this book and uh, tragedy and comedy and uh, you know, pennant races and championship bouts. Uh, just a tremendous amount of work goes into this. So I encourage people to put it on their summer reading list. Uh, there, there's excitement on every page and we couldn't even scratch the surface in the time we have now. So Dan, thank you so much. I hope to see you again soon. What are you working on uh, now? 
I have a, a bi the biography of Kenny Washington. Uh, we will be out in a year, but I'm just a couple of weeks away from getting everything into the publisher. And it has been a fa fascinating research project, a guy that uh, I think few of us know much about, and uh, he may be one of the all-time great athletes in American history. Terrific. Dan, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, David.